Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. I used to lie with an ear to the line, for that way, they said, there should come a sound escaping ahead, an iron tune of flange and piston pitched along the ground. But I never heard that. Always, instead, struck couplings and shuntings two miles away, lifted over the woods. The head of a horse swirled back from a gate, a grey turnover of haunch and mane, and I'd look up to the cutting where she'd soon appear. Two fields back in the house, small ripples shook silently across our drinking water, as they are shaking now across my heart, and vanished into where they seemed to start. Welcome to Poems to a Listener. I'm Henry Lyman, and in this half-hour program, we'll be talking again with Irish poet Seamus Heaney, reading from his poems 1965 to 1975, and from Fieldwork, both published by Farrar Strauss Giroux. Last week, we spoke about the land, the people, the farm in Northern Ireland where Seamus Heaney grew up. The program ended with the poem we just heard, the memory of a train coming from miles away, the ripples shaking the drinking water, the boy listening with his ear to the railroad tracks which ran across the farm. They ran right through it and um, we used to walk up and down the tracks as youngsters. Along the railway tracks there ran the telegraph wires and I remember Remember, as youngsters, we used to be fascinated with the when it rained along these telegraph wires along the railway track. There ran the raindrops along the wires, and we used to think that the messages were sent in these little hurrying, gleaming drops of water. <laughs> so this is a poem called "The Railway Children." When we climbed the slopes of the cutting. We were eye-level with the white cups of the telegraph poles and the sizzling wires. Like lovely freehand, they curved for miles east and miles west beyond us, sagging under their burden of swallows. We were small and thought we knew nothing worth knowing. We thought words travelled the wires in the shiny pouches of raindrops each one seeded full with the light of the sky, the gleam of the lines, and ourselves so infinitesimally scaled we could stream through the eye of a needle. We were small and thought we knew nothing worth knowing, you say in the poem, uh, but in fact I think these children knew a lot. To see the, the raindrop as a a messenger as a as a language that in a sense is the way the lyric poet wants to know the world i don't mean that he should retain a, a childlike sense of reality but the imagination but the image making or the re the ability to respond and imagine and to be freely people the world with with his imagining is is enviable and that's what i kind of why i say the chi the child knows a lot in a sense we thought we knew nothing worth knowing, but it's a wonderful way to, to see things. And the source of that imagination is always what one, I suppose, first sees, right? The, the farm, the land, that, that center. Well, for a few years, I quite almost deliberately tried to use the elements of that first world as the basis for some kind of aesthetic, you know? As a, as a way of make, trying to make it coherent. And um, the idea of water as a source, uh, the idea of uh, a pump outside the back of our house as a, as a foundation and source, uh, the idea of it as a place of supply, all that was uh, swimming. And um, the sound that the pump made when you used it, when you lifted water, it went omphalos, omphalos, omphalos. And I like to think that that's what the sound it made anyway. Omphalos being the Greek word for the, the navel. The navel. And at, at Delphi, 
there was this stone which was the omphalos, which marked the navel of the world, the world center. So in a sense, it's um, an attempt to make the little little uh, kingdom of the imagination a kind of uh, an alternative world, if you like. But it was there. Oh yes, it was literally there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a fantasy. No, no, not at all. A drink of water. She came every morning to draw water, like an old bat staggering up the field. The pumps whooping cough, the buckets clatter, and slow diminuendo as it filled announced her. I recall her grey apron the pocked white enamel of the brimming bucket and the treble creak of her voice like the pump's handle. Nights when a full moon lifted past her gable, it fell back through her window and would lie into the water set out on the table, where I have dipped to drink again, to be faithful to the admonishment on her cup. Remember the giver fading off the lip. Who was that whom the poem remembers? Well, this is an old lady uh, who lived on her own, beyond the railway lines, beyond the tracks, and who used to come to to the pump. I mean, the, the idea of the pump as a centre was also literal insofar as there were one, two, three, four families uh, who used it to get their drinking water from it. So it was in the centre there, between these various houses. Yeah, Northern. that's right. And uh, so, so I think of it as a as a centre in that way too. And she, um, this old lady was very fascinating to us because she she was kind of witch like, and she lived in a dark house with dogs. And uh, we used to go. We used to f try to find ways to get into the house. Uh, again, it both attracted us and were slightly fearful of it. And one of the conventions which was in the countryside at that time for youngsters to get into a house, you, you went up to the door and asked for a drink of water. And she used to always give us this drink in a special cup, which was obviously reserved for visitors, which had this, as I say in the poem, it had the, uh, the little motto, remember the giver, uh, to remember, as it probably was, to remember God the creator as the giver of gifts. In and you remember her too. Oh yeah, her. in the old old woman. You oh, remember yes. her and, oh, yeah. and in a way, drink. Oh yeah, again in, in right. remembering her. Well, I tried to make the water in the poem slightly magical by by describing it accurately. <laughs> that is to say that that at night uh, the the moonlight comes through into the water and it's it's just to give it a kind of glamour and fairy that uh, it's a kind of uh, mystery water when it's moonlit. Sunlight. There was a sunlit absence. The helmeted pump in the yard heated its iron. Water honeyed in the slung bucket. And the sun stood like a griddle cooling against the wall of each long afternoon. So, her hand scuffled over the bakeboard. The reddening stove sent its plaque of heat against her where she stood in a flowery apron by the window. Now she dusts the board with a goose's wing, now sits, broad-lapped, with whitened nails and measling shins. Here is a space again, the scone rising to the tick of two clocks. And here is love, like a tinsmith scoop, sunk past its gleam in the meal bin. And who's that, whom this poem remembers? That's an aunt of mine uh, who lived in the house with us, my father's sister. And she baked the bread every day in the house for years. And she bakes it with... Uh with craft, I mean, you can see it just rising there to the tick of two clocks, the scone. Yeah, 
I think I imagine that poem from the point from my point of view as a baby almost in the cradle, and um, I try just to kind of close my eyes and uh, imagine nothing but the the heat and the stillness and the light and herself moving and uh, the clock ticking, you know. Because I think that uh, somewhere in all of us, the whatever is the pace and uh, decibels of the first place you're in yeah, affects you, you know. This childhood of yours is portrayed as really being very, almost idyllic. I mean... Uh, Obviously, I wouldn't want to deny that, that they're... Fundamentally, that is the nature of the experience, the inner uh, experience of the self there was um, at peace, I guess. But the, the social side of life was complicated by, by the uh, sectarian nature of Northern Ireland society, there's no doubt about that. The sense of uh, two sides, the sense of uh, Protestant and Catholic, the sense of uh, a stealthy courtesy were at work between people of different religions. That was there too, and that was picked up naturally. But um, when the so-called troubles began, uh, it was no surprise to people who lived in, in the north of Ireland. I mean, it was all an internal condition until then it became external. It became more vehement, I suppose, than anybody might have anticipated. But uh, the sense of division and the sense of on the Catholic side, the side that I grew up in, the sense of uh, being discriminated against, the sense of the other side, the Unionists, the Protestants running the, their little kingdom to their own advantage. That was very strong too. On the other hand, um, what has to be said is that one recognised the injustice and the connivance of the uh, Protestant stroke, Unionist stroke, uh, you know, Britisher, Ulster man. He recognised him as a political common figure, as a an enemy, but the individual Protestant farmer in your own district was your neighbour rather than your enemy. So there was that ambivalence. The other side. Thigh deep in sedge and marigolds, a neighbour laid his shadow on the stream, vouching, it's as poor as Lazarus, that ground. And brushed away among the shaken leaves. I lay where his lee sloped to meet our fallow, nested on moss and rushes, my ears swallowing his fabulous biblical dismissal, that tongue of chosen people. When he would stand like that on the other side, white-haired, swinging his blackthorn at the marsh weeds. He prophesied above our scraggy acres, then turned away towards his promised furrows on the hill, a wake of pollen drifting to our bank, next season's tears. For days we would rehearse each patriarchal dictum, Lazarus, the Pharaoh, Solomon, and David and Goliath rolled magnificently, like loads of hay too big for our small lanes, or faltered on a rut. Your side of the house, I believe, hardly ruled by the book at all. His brain was a whitewashed kitchen hung with texts, swept tidy as the body of the kirk. Then, sometimes, when the rosary was dragging mournfully on in our kitchen, we would hear his step round the gable, though not until after the litany would the knock come to the door and the casual whistle strike up on the doorstep. A right-looking knight, he might say. I was dandering by, and says I, I might as well call. But now I stand behind him in the dark yard, in the moan of prayers. He puts a hand in a pocket, or taps a little tune with the blackthorn, shyly, as if he were party to love-making, 
or a stranger's weeping? Should I slip away, I wonder, or go up and touch his shoulder and talk about the weather or the price of grass seed? Oh, he was a Protestant. Yes. Yeah, he was. Um, they were Presbyterians, mostly, around our district. They used to talk about the Old Testament in the fields when they were working. I mean, the Catholics were notoriously bad-tongued, you know, swearing by Christ and all this. The Protestants were notably, uh, you know, governed their tongue. Proper. That's right. Uh, I hate the word Protestant and Catholic in some ways used in the realm of vehement political division and what I wanted to do was to try to find ways of expressing the division in other ways and one of the ways I tried was language just the way he spoke the way we spoke it was just to express difference without insisting upon enmity the speaker of the poem or you in the poem the boy in the poem mm -hmm. or young man tries to cross whatever boundary is there, um, relieve whatever tension is there, or wants to at least, by, well, talking about the weather, touching him on the shoulder, talking about the price of grass seed. Well, it asked the question, should I, should I go away or should I go up to him? But you see, politically speaking, this represents a challenge for the, if you like, the lyric artist. To what extent does he follow his natural animal instinct almost to to greet a fellow animal you know when the fellow animal is friendly rub noses or show teeth or bark or whatever um, and to what extent should he follow his own tribe you know and say your tribe are abusing our tribe and to hell with you I think the the the, the feeling in the poem is that you go up to him and talk about the weather I wish we could heal all wounds like that. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that's the way they are. I mean, they aren't, they aren't healed by sudden, miraculous uh, tissues growing. They're healed by very, very, very small tendrils beginning to spring and gradually growing into a, a vegetation of, of trust. I mean, it's really a matter of trust, finally. Uh, and the situation almost in all these divisions all over the world, because of the the amount, the backlog of violence, resentment, bad blood, memories, fears. I mean, that's it's almost impossible to trust. This morning, from a dewy motorway, I saw the new camp for the internees. A bomb had left a crater of fresh clay in the roadside. And over in the trees, machine gun posts defined a rail stockade. There was that white mist you get on a low ground, and it was deja vu, some film made of Stalag 17, a bad dream with no sound. Is there a life before death? That's chalked up on a wall downtown. Competence with pain, coherent miseries, a bite and sup, we hug our little destiny again. This poem faces the internment camps, or the speaker of the poem, you, whoever, is on a road and, and sees the internment camps, which are... They were um, initiated by the Unionist government, the British Army, uh, in... Uh, August of 1971, and they swooped on about 600 people, all, all Catholics more or less. And um, I mean, most of those people had absolutely no connection with any uh, violent organization or any, uh, they weren't in any way terrorists or whatever. And um, that caused enormous resentment in the Catholic community. And it, in a way, it animated uh, the violence on the Catholic side. Uh, the internment camp became a symbol of aggravation and the overbearing nature of the way the problem was being handled. They became a symbol of the male fist, you know. Of Britain? 
Well, Britain and, and the Unionist uh, people in the North I um, want to maintain. I want to maintain. Yes, of course. I mean, this is the point that your Protestant neighbour wants to be uh, British, and um, I mean that is the nub of the problem, really. The speaker, you in the poem, the person in the poem, turns from the site of the internment camps to hug our little destiny again, a bite and a sup, yeah. and we hug our little destiny again. How do you mean that? Well, here we go again, basically. Isn't it wonderful? This is what life offers you here. Little sectarian squabble. Lifeblood, of course, too, in that tension. After a killing. There they were, as if our memory hatched them, as if the unquiet founders walked again. Two young men with rifles on the hill, profane and bracing as their instruments. Who's sorry for our trouble? Who dreamt that we might dwell among ourselves in rain and scarred light and wind-dried stones? Basalt, blood, water, headstones, leeches. In that neuter original loneliness from Brandon to Dunseverick, I think of small-eyed survivor flowers, the pined for unmolested orchid. I see a stone house by a pier, elbow room, broad window light. The heart lifts. You walk twenty yards to the boats and buy mackerel. And today a girl walks in home to us, carrying a basket full of new potatoes, three tight green cabbages, and carrots with the tops and mould still fresh on them. One is struck by that uh, contrast between the, the young men with their rifles, the young civil warriors, be they Protestant or Catholic, and, and that girl coming home from the market with, with cabbages and carrots. The, the killing in question there was the British ambassador in, in Dublin, which was a terrible moment, really. Moment of embarrassment and disgrace within the country. I mean, to kill an ambassador seems to me to be a, you know, a big, deep affront. And the IRA had done that. And the, um, the interesting problem for the Irish nation, for the Re Republic of Ireland, the south of Ireland, was that this freedom fighter image, this gorilla, this young man on the hill with the rifle, is one of the dream images of the founders of the state, you know, the freedom fighter, who is a hallowed uh, traditional figure. But at this moment, the state which the freedom fighter had founded, the Republic of Ireland, and had honorably fought for and so on, this state was now responsible for this uh, criminal and uncivilized action of shooting an ambassador. And this same noble founding image, the young man with the rifle, was responsible for it. And yet there's that girl with the... Well, the indeed, that, that evening, uh, this, this, this kid came to babysit for us, and she, she, she just seemed to, I mean, she offer all the all that the imagination longs for, some kind of fruition, some kind of... She was like a little Ceres walking in the land, uh, saying, implying, you know, that there was a, a good vegetable life for the spirit was possible, as well as this troubled uh, moral life. The Tomb Road. One morning early, I met armoured cars in convoy, warbling along on powerful tyres, all camouflaged with broken alder branches and headphoned soldiers standing up in turrets. How long were they approaching down my roads as if they owned them? The whole country was sleeping. I had rights of way, fields, cattle in my keeping. Tractors hitched to buck rakes and open sheds, silos, 
chill gates, wet slates, the greens and reds of outhouse roofs. Whom should I run to tell among all of those with their back doors on the latch for the bringer of bad news, that small hours visitant who, by being expected, might be kept distant? Sowers of seeds, erectors of headstones. O oh, charioteers above your dormant guns, it stands here still, stands vibrant as you pass, the invisible, untoppled omphalos. The pump. Yeah, the thing is, I wanted to, I want to make a statement quite clearly that there are certain uh, values and certain attachments and certain coherences that uh, aren't uh, breakable in some ways, or shouldn't be. This is not a matter of uh, uh, saying anything to my Protestant neighbours. I mean, they too share their own philosophy. But there are certain presences that are outsiders and intruders. And uh, for one reason or another they're there, but they'll go eventually. And that uh, oracle life, that omphalos life, will, will be there when they go. Is the pump still there? Well, interesting enough, the pump has been changed. The pump had to be moved because of uh, certain renovations and, you know, modernizations and extensions in the yard. So sitting to the edge of the yard, now the last time I saw the pump, I lifted the lid off it. It is no longer uh, lifting water from a spring, it's just at the edge of the yard. And I lifted the lid off it and a bird was nesting in the top of it. So I thought to myself, well, you know, that's all right. <laughs> There's still life there. <laughs> and there was a little egg sitting in the pump. I think it's the best place for the bird to nest. <laughs> yes. Let's come up the snout with a bump and into the thing. Changes. As you came with me in silence to the pump in the long grass, I heard much that you could not hear. The bite of the spade that sank it, the slithering and grumble as the mason mixed his mortar, and women coming with white buckets like flashes on their ruffled wings. The cast iron rims of the lid clinked as I uncovered it. Something stirred in its mouth. I had a bird's eye view of a bird, finch green, speckly white, nesting on dry leaves, flattened, still, suffering the light. So I roofed the citadel as gently as I could and told you, and you gently unroofed it. But where was the bird now? There was a single egg, pebbly white, and in the rusted bend of the spout, tail feathers splayed and sat tight. So tender, I said, remember this. It will be good for you to retrace this path when you have grown away and stand at last at the very centre of the empty city. We've been talking with poet Seamus Heaney, reading from his poems 1965 to 1975, and from Fieldwork, both published by Farah Strauss Giroux. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for being with us. Poems to a Listener was produced by WFCR, Amherst, Massachusetts, with technical assistance by Sheldon Katzman. Financial assistance was provided by the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Massachusetts Foundation for Humanities and Public Policy.